Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's event and author talk with Dr. Carol McKibben. My name is Hisela. I'm an adult services librarian with the Salinas Public Library, and I'll be handling the tech side of today's event along with my supervisor, Kathy Andrews. Today's event consists of a 45-minute presentation from Dr. McKibben as she discusses her book, Salinas, A History of Race and Resilience in an Agricultural City. It will be followed by a 15-minute Q&A from the audience. As always, we'd like to give a special thank you to our speaker, Dr. Carol McKibben, and I'll let Kathy you. tell you a little bit more about her. Thank you. It's really been our pleasure to work with Dr. McKibben getting ready for this author talk. Very exciting for us at the library uh, with the Salinas history. Dr. McKibben is an Organization of American Historians Distinguished Lecturer. She has been teaching courses in California history, urban history, and immigration history for the Department of History and Urban Studies at Stanford University since 2006. She's also engaged in numerous community-based research projects on the Monterey Peninsula for 30 years. You may be familiar with her earlier books, her first one, Beyond Cannery Row, Sicilian Women, Immigration and Community in Monterey, and then the one about seaside, Racial Beachhead, Diversity and Democracy in a Military Town. Um, Dr. McKibben is an excellent speaker. I hope you all will enjoy it. And we look forward to the Q&A at the end. Dr. McKibben, go ahead. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for that kind introduction. I also thank all of you for graciously allowing me to talk about my recent book on the history of Salinas. I'm so excited to share some of what I've learned here. I began studying Salinas's history in 2016 with the assumption that I could build on what had already been written about this fascinating city. It's agricultural, but it's an urban place that encapsulated many of the most challenging issues in California. But I was wrong. Much of what had been done earlier, whether it was scholarly or not, focused only on small parts of the story rather than the whole. One ethnic community or one personal perspective or only on one issue and within a very limited time frame. There was no overview available for me to build on. So I had quite a lot of work to do. I didn't do it alone. I'd like to say a word in support of and in tribute to libraries and the Steinbeck Library in particular as fundamental to the work of scholars like myself. Sources published and unpublished that live in these libraries make up the building blocks of history. However, we historians cannot possibly navigate our way through those critical documents without the guidance of trained, skilled, and caring librarians and archivists. Their work may be less visible, uh, but is in no way less significant than the work of those of us who appear on the covers of books as the authors. In short, no history of any person place, event, or issue can possibly be written without the guidance and support of librarians and archivists, including and especially this one about Salinas. So as an example, Salinas's National Steinbeck Center contains an almost complete collection of the author's work because of the dogged efforts of John Gross, a Holocaust survivor, who arrived in Salinas in 1964 to take on the job of library director. He was determined to um, create a collection of Steinbeck's work that included everything from original manuscripts to personal letters. And that has informed an enormous volume of new scholarship on Steinbeck. Gross's energy and purpose also prompted the creation of the National Steinbeck Center here, which has become an incredibly valuable collection for scholars and the anchor of vital redevelopment of downtown, especially in the aftermath of the 1992 Loma Prieta earthquake, which devastated Main Street. One of the goals of this book has been to integrate backstories such as his into the framework of Salinas's and California's history. It wasn't easy to be sure, but it was essential. I also aim to integrate a breadth of new scholarship on California and the West from the 19th century to the present to engage with it and to challenge it too. 
participants in history are equally critical to the construction of any narrative. So I cannot begin to name and thank everyone who agreed to share their personal and family stories with me. That said, context is everything in writing history. So I wove those stories into this analysis and included the broader California historical context, American history, and recent scholarly work to embed this narrative into the big picture of America and construct a legitimate piece of scholarship that takes its place in the world of academia, but also sometimes challenges conventional academic wisdom. Personal experiences and viewpoints added depth, vibrancy, examples, and power to data that came from census tables and newspapers and a myriad of government documents, meeting minute notes, my favorite things. I combined the understandings of multiple people, multiple communities, the published and unpublished documents to construct a narrative history that spanned two and a half centuries. I integrated in the best way that I could this new knowledge that came from this collection of sources, which also presented me with this conundrum of how to integrate new discoveries into a narrative that didn't just feel like I was adding material in order to be politically correct or fashionable. I really wanted to utilize it all to rethink the past, to understand in the fullest possible way what happened, to explain in the very best way how we as a community, we as Americans evolved into what and who we are today for better and for worse. Actors in American history are cr of critical import to this whole process, yet so many of them have been ignored because they belong to the wrong gender, the wrong race or ethnicity, the wrong culture, or they were on the losing side of events, or they were just too poor and not the leaders of cities or movements, and so they were overlooked, or sometimes all of the above. When we dismiss and disregard these people, however, we distort and diminish our own history. Our aim, my aim, is to try to set things right by paying attention to everyone who participated in the making of Salinas, to all the actors in this story, whoever they were, and at every stage in the historical process, so that I could try to dispel the myths of the past and replace them with a more complete and more accurate narrative. I could not possibly interview everybody who ever lived in Salinas, nor could I represent every single community or ethno-racial group without losing the narrative thread. I had to make some decisions about that. I did not focus on African-Americans, Koreans, South Asians, Swiss Italians, or the Jewish community, or other Southern and Eastern European groups, all of whom lived and worked in this city. But I did include each of these groups in my analyses of civil rights, labor relations, politics, and economic development when I could, when it was appropriate. Inclusion is important, but it is different from trying to analyze every single group and every group dynamic, much less interview every single person. But I incorporated as many voices as I could. It was important to me to create a real narrative, to make intelligible sense of an analysis of Salinas's history in the context of California and the nation, and at the same time to incorporate this breadth of new scholarship on a range of issues. So I tried to be judicious about those oral histories. I utilized them to make a point, to illustrate a moment better, and to be representative without just listing one oral history after another. So I'd like to spend our time today sharing what that still imperfect and often messy process looks like and how by working towards inclusion and context, we tell a better story and construct better history. Not happy history, nor history based on blame or victimization, but history that shows the full range of humanity, which includes women and is representative of everyone who participated, their struggles, tensions, and conflicts, their efforts at coalition and community building too, and the compromises they made as they faced both everyday life 
and multiple crises over time in the economy, in politics, in social and cultural life, as they faced the consequences of unexpected events, including wars and big environmental changes. In other words, history that is fundamentally inclusive of all groups in good times and bad, that respects Americans, every single one of us, in our continual effort to create community in this ever-changing world. For example, in the new scholarly discourse on 19th century California, as it transitioned from Spanish to American control, indigenous people are activists and agents of their destinies, not just victimized by American policies of genocide and forced displacement, although that is also a part and an essential part of American history. I didn't have the space to devote to the full history of indigenous populations in Monterey County, but I did include some of those sources in my footnotes. And I do hope to do some of that in follow-up pieces and articles that acknowledge those survival strategies, which included identifying as Mexican nationals rather than tribal members and intermarrying with Californios throughout the 19th century. This all kept Ohlone culture alive and Ohlone people from annihilation by new Anglo-American settler colonials. As we know now, Ohlone people are alive and well in California. Their descendants, the descendants of those first peoples, are still here in Salinas. Settler colonialism, however, implies victims and oppressors. That was true, but that wasn't the whole story, as my work here showed. There was much more agency here, which a lot of current scholarship minimizes and even overlooks. So in the case of settlement, this work challenges that literature. For example, far from rolling over and just accepting American hegemony, after the end of the Mexican War in 1848, Salinas became Salinas and the county seat after years of wrangling between powerful, wealthy, land-owning Californio families, railroad barons, new Anglo-American settlers, European immigrants, and Chinese leaders from San Francisco. All sorts of individuals fought over where a town ought to be constructed. Alisal, RMF Soto's land, was the most logical spot, not the swampy center where Salinas was actually built. And Juan Castro made a good case to the railroads to bypass Alisal, Salinas, and even Monterey in favor of Castroville. Californios were shrewd and self-interested politicians who sometimes prevailed over their less wealthy Anglo-American counterparts as they fought for a place in the new American-owned mainstream. The railroad barons and government officials had their own motivations for supporting development in this town, but not that one. Salinas, but not Monterey, for instance, up and down the coast of California, as they sought to create connections to markets throughout the continental United States and enrich themselves, by the way. These disparate people battled with one another, but they also built coalitions, and they created a town in this specific place in 1874. Most of the first settlers had in common financial connections and support from San Francisco in various forms. These cities and towns that were built in California at that time were created intentionally as essential reinforcements for the development of San Francisco. So I described that whole process in depth in the first section of this book women arrived, both alone and within families, and became part of the processes of city building from the outset. Therefore, the commonly understood and often repeated founding story of Salinas, which credited a few white American small businessmen who had an accidental wagon breakdown on their way to Monterey and created a town in the middle of the swamp, commissioning anonymous male Chinese laborers from Monterey to drain the swamp and help them was seriously incomplete and sometimes even wrong. Chinese people were mentioned only in this version as male contract laborers, which some were, but it is equally true that many lived here in family groups and were full partners in the settlement process in Chinese and Anglo-American communities. 
Evidence also showed that although Chinese laborers drained the swamps, they also negotiated astutely to gain profit from farm crops they produced in those swamps. And in so doing, created wealth for themselves to build businesses and become independent retailers and farmers, even if anti-Asian land laws precluded them from owning that land and they were um, prevented from uh, naturalization and citizenship. The Chinese and Chinese American first arrivals and settlers were not all contract laborers. Some were wealthy and well-connected to San Francisco's Chinese community as a deeper look into the Salinas sources revealed. Many were members of the gangs or tongs established in San Francisco as a means of protection in a vicious anti-Chinese environment that was California in the late 19th century. Salinas and other smaller cities and towns in the San Francisco hinterland sometimes became safe havens for them even though many places were just as violently anti-Chinese as San Francisco. Context and place always matter, but it was through the eyes of a little girl growing up in Salinas's Chinatown at the turn of the last century that I found a critical piece of the puzzle that helped me understand the role that places like Salinas had in California history, especially in race relations. Blanche Atai vividly recalled growing up in Salinas's Chinatown as on the other side of the tracks. She knew she belonged to a community of people excluded and marginalized by race, but she also described attending an integrated public school. She noted that sidewalks had been laid in Chinatown as a big event for the people there. According to most scholars of urban California, infrastructure development such as sidewalks was something that rarely, if ever, happened in the barrios and Chinatowns of cities in California. So Salinas's history here challenges that scholarship, which paints all communities of color as uniformly destitute and completely excluded from the processes of city building. Barrios and Chinatowns were marginalized, to be sure, but there are many shades of gray that depended on the particular region and setting they were located in. Salinas's Chinatown, in other words, had similarities to San Francisco's or San Jose's or even Los Angeles's, but there were important differences, too, that must be accounted for in both scholarship and popular understandings that more accurately describe the history of these places and of California itself. When I read about the way Blanche Atai enthused about the Salinas Rodeo, clearly expressing a sense of belonging, also rare in scholarly text about California for people of either indigenous, African, Mexican, or Asian descent, I took notice. She remembered with fondness that her cousins arrived from San Jose to participate in the festivities just like everybody else in town. All this made me think more deeply about the meaning and significance of sidewalks, integrated schools, and cultural inclusions. And alongside other evidence of the era, I began to appreciate the extent to which these may have worked effectively to preempt a direct challenge to the status quo, blunting the most obvious forms of racism and marginalization that Chinese and other white non-white people endured. As well, Blanche described her mom's role as a community matriarch, her work in feeding and sheltering community members who found themselves destitute or just isolated. Just what white middle-class women did during the progressive era and beyond. Yet her Chinese American mother certainly didn't get invited to any of the preeminent middle-class women's groups in Salinas forming at that time, notable for their inclusions of newly arrived European origin ethnic immigrants, nor did any other woman of Asian descent, regardless of their class status. So this was evidence of a structure of racism predominant in Salinas too, and everywhere in American life that would have been invisible because it was so normalized.
Blanche Atai's father, like many other members of the Chinese community, was a merchant retailer with kin and business connections to San Francisco. It was not just white people who had those connections to the big city. I looked at documents and materials that supported Tai's narrative of Chinese community in Salinas. It was like every other community, a complex mixture in terms of gender, class, stage of migration, time of migration, and links to other California munis municipalities, particularly to San Francisco. As the town developed in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, Chinese people played an important role in establishing businesses and contributing actively to the city. They were not the only community from the continent of Asia to do so, however. Before the stringent anti-Asian immigration restrictions of the 19 teens and 1920s were put in place, Chinese families were joined after the Spanish-American War ended in 1898 by new groups of immigrant Filipinos, Japanese, and other Asians, including Sikhs and Koreans, mostly by way of the Hawaiian uh, plantations. Portuguese and other ethnic groups from Southern and Eastern European countries arrived in these years too. Everyone became part of the city, the fabric of the city of Salinas, even though not everyone could run for office, much less own land, or become naturalized citizens or even vote. All of that was based on perceptions of race and definitions of whiteness. Inclusions were limited. After the 1924 Johnson-Reed Act closed off immigration from all of Asia and severely restricted immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe, increased numbers of Mexican-Americans and African-Americans arrived in Salinas to work in agriculture, joined by those fleeing the Dust Bowl and the depression of the 1930s. And together, they made this a truly multiracial, multicultural city. I could not devote equal attention in this book to all these individuals and communities, or I would have lost my narrative flow, but there is room going forward to do just that for me and for other similarly inspired historians. Yet, none of these were homogenous communities, any more than white ones were. There were dividing lines within ethnic and racial communities that included both region of origin, time and stage of migration, gender and class. So there was no one Filipino, Japanese or Chinese or Mexican community any more than there was a one white one at any point in time. But multiple groups within each of them, each with its own hierarchy and strategy for survival within the context of an often hostile white middle class American mainstream that considered itself the superior race. Again, this system was sustained and disguised in no small part by those cultural events, access to middle class life that included home and business ownership that provided a, a facade of inclusion and quieted any potential challenges to the system in place. So race and racism mattered in constructing the story of Salinas, but it was nuanced and complicated, not simply oppression, but also innovation, survival. All of that gave rise to energized, thriving communities. Most of them are clearly still in place in Salinas. Women played important roles in city building, whoever they were. They need to be recognized and respected. I discovered in one of my most treasured sources, the minutes of the meetings from the Business and Professional Women's Club of Salinas that began in 1911, evidence that city council members and representatives of the Salinas Chamber of Commerce routinely attended those meetings to ask for support for everything from building infrastructure to increasing taxes. Women, mostly from the middle classes, so were not only housewives in the traditional sense, but also activists, business people, and professionals. I included a formerly ignored Danish-American physician, Dr. May Guideson, who founded what we now know as Natividad Hospital to illustrate the role that ambitious women played in Salinas's history. I included Ruth Andresen, my one of my sheroes, <laughs> who led Salinas's and Monterey County's environmental movement in the 1970s that forced 
Humble Oil Company to relocate out of the area, saving Monterey Bay. I focused on powerful women public servants like Ana Caballero and Phyllis Muir, but also tried to incorporate lesser known but equally powerful voices of women activists and citizens, such as Olga Reyna Garcia, Susan Aramis, and Lucy Pizarro, who formed the bulwark of the farm worker movement of the 1970s. This all supports the rich scholarship on the important roles that women played during the progressive era and throughout the 20th century in building communities and cities throughout California and the nation. Yet, like Salinas's Chinatown, some parts of the city enjoyed infrastructure and better development more than others. Alisal and East Salinas famously remained neglected spaces long after annexation of both by 1963. Arguably, this happened because of racist policies and practices that made areas of cities occupied by people of color less desirable, both for investment and for residency. Scholarship is solidly behind that argument, and research that I did on the efforts to annex Santa Rita and Alisal also showed that these became attractive to Salinas's residents and government only when they were populated by white people, former dust bowlers who were able to build homes and businesses in that area with the support of federal policies firmly in place that allowed them uh, the funding to do that. And thus they created communities of white Americans, even as Alisal remained multiracial and always included populations of Asian and Mexican descent. This is not to deny the hard work of dust bowlers, but it is to argue that state and federal policies certainly shaped unequal development and investment in cities throughout the nation based on race. However, I also found that an unfortunate confluence of external forces played an even more critical role in the underdevelopment of Alisal as well. And I complicated this narrative with those. I read, I love minutes of city council meetings. I read these minutes <laughs> throughout the post annexation era of the 1960s and the early 1970s. And I discovered that in almost every meeting, the council was focused on investing in Alisal and East Salinas to build better and more housing, more schools, more parks and other amenities. But the tax revolts of the late 1970s left the city pretty helpless it, with a very limited ability to raise any money to pay for any of it. The fiscal belt tightening of both state and federal level of the 80s and 1990s created a huge deficit in Salinas that even led to the infamous closure of this library. It was only through the heroic efforts of Mayor Ana Caballero, the first Latina on the city council and the first woman mayor of Salinas, although not the last, and that this is a shout out to Mayor Kimberly Craig, who is currently mayor. Her all-female city council of those early 1990s years got together and energized the, the community to raise enough new tax money to reopen the libraries and begin the critical revitalization process for both downtown and Alisal that is now in place. So racism played a role in underdevelopment in Alisal to be sure, but it was not as simple as it appeared. Paying attention to sources such as city council meeting minutes and contextualizing Salinas's history into California history and American history in the 1970s through the 1990s disrupts a scholarly narrative that looks at underdevelopment as simply racist. Salinas's tempestuous history on labor relations also challenges much of the scholarship on 20th century labor in California. Here again, context is everything, but place really matters. Scholars often create sharp racial dividing lines between growers and workers in labor disputes. Whites are the powerful elite owners of corporate agriculture pitted against working people of color. Our Pulitzer Nobel Prize winning author, John Steinbeck, was an exception to that rule as he portrayed both sides as white, 
partly because it was true, dust bowlers certainly made up a significant part of agriculture's working class in the 1930s, but partly to gain empathy and support from white Americans outside of agricultural regions who might more readily sympathize with other whites than with workers of Filipino descent or with African-American or Mexican-American workers. However, in Salinas, the labor strikes of the 1930s and the civil rights actions of the 1970s complicate our understanding both of labor and civil rights. In Salinas, race mattered, but class mattered too, and occupation mattered. And when it came to a controversial issue such as the 1936 labor strike or during the United Farm Worker Movement. In 1930, I learned from this wonderful new source material in the archives of the Grower Shipper Association in the basement, buried beneath a lot of other stuff. And I also looked at Filipino and Japanese primary sources and a heretofore undiscovered union newspaper only available in hard copy in Monterey County Historical Society. It's called The Independent that the dividing lines were at best blurred, complicated by occupation and position in agriculture, by stage of migration, by gender, by ethnic and racial identity, that growers and shippers were more divided than united and often in chaos, fighting, not the homogenous formidable entity that they appeared to be in much of our scholarship. The same proved to be true in the 1970s. Women were on both sides of the bargaining table as labor activists and organizers, as strikers, and often as the strongest defenders of corporate agriculture. In the 1920s, people of Filipino descent developed a strong family-oriented middle-class community based largely on the occupation of labor contractor in agriculture. Women in this community led the way in community building, forming important organizations, and became the bulwark of a network of Filipino communities throughout California, which they expressed in multiple cultural events that drew people together in celebration of their shared national heritage. They also demanded and received recognition as equal members of Salinas's cultural world. As an, an example of this came in the form of the citywide celebration in honor of Filipino war hero, Jose Rizal. The women's group appeared before the city council and received financial and community support for the event to be held just after Christmas every year, starting in the, the 1920s and through the beginning of World War II, drawing tens of thousands of visitors to Salinas from everywhere in California and the nation included such speakers as David Starr Jordan from Stanford. The entire city participated in this. Main Street shut down for the parade. It was only one of the many indicators of a middle-class Filipino presence that included women and families, even though the scholarly literature on Filipino experience in California is often limited to male field workers and a male-dominated community. We are all too familiar with the evils of forced removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans after Pearl Harbor. And unlike our collective response to the 12 generations of slavery inflicted on African Americans, this country has now made reparations to people of Japanese descent. However, when we listen to personal accounts, as I related here, we realize uh, how the pain and suffering of those experiences were central to the story of Salinas and World War II also. I looked through these newspapers at the time, and there is not one mention of the incarceration, although it happened right in the middle of town, and the assembly center was located in the Rodeo grounds. This story needs to intersect with the history of World War II in Salinas, with the history of the first USO, located here with the relationship between Salinas and Fort Ord, the airport that was built, the newfound embrace of Filipinos and Chinese Americans as compatriots instead of outsiders and the soldier stories that make a more complete and more authentic history of World War II and especially as it played out in Salinas.
In Salinas, the middle classes that came out of the world of agricultural contracting businesses were an essential part of agriculture and engaged directly with growers and shippers over wages and working conditions. They were also disdained by them, as the meeting records made clear. Even as they and Japanese contractors also sided with growers in labor disputes and sometimes sold out their co-ethnic workers who demanded higher wages than growers were willing to offer, or contractors just failed to pay workers altogether. So the Filipino community was divided by class, just like every other community. It was also divided by region, stage of migration, and educational level. These divisions became starker after World War II, and especially after revisions to immigration policy, beginning with the hart seller Act in 1965, which led to a brand new immigration of well-educated Filipino, Japanese, Chinese, and other Asian professionals without any institutional memory of marginalization on American soil. Conflicts among co-ethnics ensued. This development happened in all of the communities of Salinas in the post-war. Replenishment of population led to conflict as much as it did to community buildings. The dividing lines within communities also became clear in the Salinas context of the farm worker movement of the 1970s. There is much new evidence here that even former Filipino, Mexican, Japanese, and Dust Bowl workers who fought on the front lines in 1936 and had experienced personally the harsh attacks from growers and others uh, in that strike had little or no sympathy for Mexican field workers in 1970, even defending the use of the short-handled hoe. The bitter fights, however, over labor and civil rights and land use in the 1970s did not lead to a radical politics in Salinas, as so many people feared. Far from it. It did empower and energize a well-educated group of new professionals, mostly teachers and lawyers, many of whom came right out of Cesar Chavez and the UFW and Sarah Lay. They ran for office and worked for equity in urban redesign and redevelopment in policymaking and representation. Moderates all. They helped the city overcome the crises such as the library closures, and we think of Ana Caballero, maldevelopment, Simone Salinas, and police overreach in the 2000s. So this book about Salinas marks a beginning. It's meant not just to inform, but to empower. The Steinbeck Library and its staff of incredible librarians and archivists have worked for decades to preserve and protect, but more importantly, to share sources that go beyond a collection of oral histories or individual memories, but also include a wide range of material from the city that help us piece together understandings of the past that in the end are more accurate because they are inclusive. But we also need to engage with this new scholarship on California history and the West in order to put Salinas in appropriate context. I hope this book will help everyone who wants to study and research their own history and write about it to do just that. Every story about every moment in Salinas's history, in California history and American history, from its founding to its present, must include all the actors who responded to and were enmeshed in the challenges of their day. When we look at history through all their eyes, take in all their experiences and perspectives, we learn a different, more complete, and more compelling story, not just about Salinas, but about California and the nation. I focused my book on the people of Salinas, past and present, who were vital actors throughout its long history, who shaped Salinas into what it is today, a multiracial, multicultural, urban place in an agricultural environment, a place that survived and thrived, not despite all the challenges of the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries, but because of them. I thank you, and I welcome all of your questions and comments. Thanks, Carol. That was quite wonderful. And uh, Isela, how are we doing? Have we got some questions? 
Yes, we had a great question from Cesar. You kind of touched a little bit upon it already. Um, he wants you, if you could talk a little bit more about flashpoints like the labor union strikes in the 1930s and the 1970s, how that reshaped the valley and also talking about the issues, not just talking around race, but also around class. Okay, great question, first of all. I think that one of the big impacts of those strikes has often been minimized and unfairly so. And it was a big turning point because it polarized the community in many ways in the middle of it, but not for the reasons that we think it did. Many people were on the front lines of the strike, both for and against, because they felt humiliated by the media attention that they received that was oh so negative and were mortified that this city that they were trying to build as a very desirable place for investment and settlement throughout the 20th century, and this was especially true in 1970, suddenly became a pariah. And that kind of publicity terrified people. And I was very surprised when I began this work at the long, long memory that people had of those strikes, that they kept very close to their hearts, how it made them feel to be the center of negative media attention and how it seemed to disrupt the course that Salinas was on as a place that was going to be an up and coming center of the Central Coast region. That was its aim from the beginning. So I hope that answers the question that that was an unexpected turn. And when we think about the strikes, we think about the strikes that were limited to uh, the people who were part of uh, the industry. But in fact, it really brought everybody in for and against. It really made Salinas a center of polarized activism. And a lot of that sentiment remained. Carol, one of our um, attendees mentions about the uh, Bataan Memorial Park, the small park in Salinas. Um, do you have any insight about uh, the impact um, on the city from the all the military men that were um, trapped on Bataan? Oh yeah, that was really a painful moment. But one thing about it was that it was not known for sure what had happened to them until after the war. And when Salinas was held up as the poster child for anti-Japanese sentiment, a lot of that came about because the knowledge of the, the march suddenly became evident and widespread. And so there was a lot of pushback. So yes, I mean, the story of World War II is complicated at best. And I tell that story by focusing on the incarceration, but I also talk about the soldiers who were part of the death march and how that impacted the city forever. And that's why that park and that tribute is there and it should be there. It's very important. And it was, um, it had a lot to do with the anti-Japanese sentiment. So we know that there was a big petition going on that resisted Japanese resettlement after the war. And largely that anger uh, came about because the knowledge about the Bataan death march became public knowledge. Uh, it was, it didn't happen during the war. It happened really in the post-war. Um, thanks, Carol. We have another question from Noemi. She's just interested in learning a little bit more about the Braceros. Could you talk a little bit about that? I have a whole section in my book about the Braceros. Thank you for that question. Yes, uh, it was a, and again, it was complicated. At first, uh, the Bracero program, when I looked at the grower shipper records, wow, the back and forth that was going on in the 40s, trying to replace a labor force that was now engaged as soldiers, right, in the war effort. Uh, and there was a lot more money to be made in war industry than there was in picking anything. So that the Bracero program came about in that way. I looked at it both from the perspective of the growers who needed labor and also from the per perspective of descendants of Braceros who really suffered from that program. They did not make money. 
for sure. But a lot of them blamed the Mexican government for that because their money was supposed to be saved for them and then given to them uh, after they finished their tenure. There's a lot of detail about that in my book. I urge you to read that section. I can't do justice to it here. Suffice it to say that until the 1960 accident that Lori Flores documents in much more detail, the Salinas Mexican American community was very divided about the Braceros. The UFW really saw the Bracero program and the effort to recruit non-union labor as a way of undercutting the efforts of Anastar Galarza and others who were trying to organize field workers. So there was a lot of conflict within the workers in Salinas, whether they were Braceros or not, about that program. And unfortunately, Braceros were not treated very well in the city because of that. I mean, there was a feeling that they were undermining the efforts of union organization. They were outsiders. They were only here temporarily, not on a path to citizenship. And everyone else in Salinas arrived with the intention of staying, right? So uh, people who were temporary workers were kind of on the margins of the margins. It wasn't just race. It was also the fact that they were not on a path to citizenship either. And that complicated things. But I, I devoted a whole section of the book to the Braceros and their role in Salinas. And I urge you to read that. It's a very, very significant part of Salinas's history. Thank you. That was a great overview. Thank you so much, Carol. And we have another question from Patricia surrounding like the acquisition of the Santa Rita area, whether that was in unincorporated area or whether it was its own community? Um, was it native burial ground? Um, around what time was it incorporated into Salinas? Um, if you could tell us a little bit more about that. The answer is yes. <laughs> it was all of the above. And Salinas wanted to, you know, pound its chest in the 1950s and 60s and understood that annexation of space meant power. And it also meant federal investment. So if you could show a bigger space with more people, you received more money from the federal government for development. So it was in your interest to annex places like Santa Rita and Alisal. However, these were sparsely settled areas. Alisal much more settled than Santa Rita. Santa Rita was annexed first. And you know the exact date of the annexation is in that section of my book that talks about annexations. But it was very much a 1960s effort that bigger is better and that if you wanted to attract industry and make yourself um, an economic powerhouse, you needed land. And Santa Rita and Alisal presented Salinas with great opportunities for that because this is a flat area. You could easily build an industrial plant here. And that added to a tax base that really would lead to more development. And more development was always considered better. This was an era of growth. It was an era where all growth was good. Population growth was good and development was good. And it was all considered a positive thing and led to Salinas's image of itself as the powerhouse for the entire Central Coast region. That is why in 1970, when uh, the farm worker movement brought all this negative attention to Salinas, so many people, business people, professional people freaked out because it, it made Salinas look bad and no one was gonna wanna live here if there were fights in the fields, right? So no one was gonna wanna invest. So that was part of the issue during that era uh, when all of these big industrial plants were emerging because of these annexations. And now they're contested. They, they weren't so contested at the time. They, they were a little bit, but not really. Uh, it's now that they're being contested. And now that the historical, the archaeological evidence is coming coming to light more. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. We have another question uh, from Miriam. Um, in your work, what agency can you tell us about women who were critical to the labor movement 
are the key leaders whose presence or action or work that stood out? Women in the labor movement were at several, you know, junctures. I talk about community service organization in my work. I talk about um, women activists. I wanted to emphasize the women who were also just participants, right? Who were people who marched, not necessarily led. Uh, I always lean towards that. So I emphasize that and tried to talk about that experience. And I really, really wanted to emphasize the role that women played in Salinas's history because it was so vital. And in that, I mention and spend a great deal of time in this book on one woman um, educator who created the most forward-thinking bilingual education program ever, ever, ever in the state of California, Virginia Roca Barton. And when I came to look at Salinas, I saw her name everywhere. And I wondered why, why was she considered so important? What did she do? And I realized just what she did. She supported the Alisal at so many levels. And importantly, just made a decision as superintendent to create bilingual education in Salinas. Her work is a model, could have been a model for bilingual education programs going forward. A lot of it was forgotten and left by the wayside, but there were so many important players in Salinas's history. It was impossible to do justice to all of them. And the farm worker movement was very, very critical moment. I think the most important part of it was the feeling of empowerment it gave residents who had been marginalized. So I mentioned the story of Lucy Pizarro, one of my other favorite uh, heroines, because she started a little restaurant that became a political powerhouse. And it also was where everybody who was anybody and were re was running for office went to Chapala restaurant. Uh, and she was energized by the farm worker movement. So a lot of people did some great positive things because of that. And we can't put that aside. Thank you. Um, we have another question um, from Karen about whether you wrote about environmental issues in your book. Um, she explicitly lists toxins like pesticides, fungicides, and fumigants, um, but I know that it's definitely a topic that was touched upon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, environmentalism is very important, and in the 1970s, it kind of focused, like every other environmental movement in America, on the coastline, on water, on clean water, right? Uh, it's only in the 1990s that pesticide use and the idea of environmental racism comes into the academic vocabulary. People start studying it, right? It's very difficult to prove cause and effect, but I would have liked to have gone into that in more detail because I think it's really, really important. And I think that it is increasingly a cause for concern, notably because the expansion that Salinas has done in terms of widening its footprint, building more schools and parks are happening in the very areas that experience the highest use of pesticides. So school children in Salinas, we, we need new schools, but where are we going to build them in these older agricultural zones that were heavily treated? And those pesticides are still alive and well and with us. I'm not an expert on pesticide use. I leave that to others. But I will say that this is a conundrum here because we need new land. We need to use especially uh, agricultural land that is not as fertile anymore, right? But it's difficult to uh, rationalize using land that has been poisoned. So this is an ongoing issue. It's an ongoing problem. I deal with it at, to some extent, but again, you know, this book was uh, originally over 600 pages long and my darling editors at Stanford Press cut out 150 pages and a lot of that was the current. <laughs> so I wish I could have done more. I think more needs to be done with this and it needs to be brought into the conversation about environmental racism and environmental justice in California that should go beyond the inner cities and include agriculture. Right. We had one more question. It was if you can comment on the relationship of any um, in the early 20th century between the Salinas Chinatowns and the Chinese communities on the Monterey Peninsula. 
there was a lot of uh, antipathy. The Chinatowns on the Monterey Peninsula were targeted by mobs and burned to the ground. People in the Salinas Chinese community expressed a sense of more acceptance in Salinas than they did elsewhere, especially if they were middle class and uh, discrimination outside of uh, Salinas. So I think there was always connection, but there was always comparison and not so great comparison that Monterey's Chinese community, Pacific Grove's Chinese community was destroyed. I think that I found more connection within Filipino communities up and down the coast than either Japanese or Chinese communities. There was not that much of a link. They were much more isolated. On the Monterey Peninsula, I think Salinas was the friendlier setting. Does that help? All great questions. It does, yeah. These are all um, great questions. And one last thing, you know, you can email me. I'm, I'm happy. You, it's okay. It's not private. I can, if you have a question or a comment, I'd love to hear it. And please feel free to do that. Thank you, Dr. McKibben. And thank you, everyone who joined us today. Um, keep your eyes out. We're hoping to collaborate with Dr. McKibben for some in-person workshops on Selena's history once, it's, once it feels really safe to be back together. So, <laughs> um, anyone who wants to get on our email newsletter, uh, you're welcome to reach out to the library, and we are happy to join up with you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. All mine. Yeah, very good. And thank you all very much.